It's The Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert, coming to you from Baltimore. Once again, President Trump is tweeting how well the U.S. economy is doing. Last Monday, he tweeted, The economy is so good, perhaps the best in our country's history. Remember, it's the economy stupid, that the Democrats are flailing and lying like crazy. A little later that day, during the daily White House press briefing, White House Council of Economic Advisers Chair Kevin Hassett gave a presentation on the economy's performance under the Trump presidency. According to Hassett, the economy took off with Trump's election in November 2016. And I think that if anyone were to assert that the uh, capital spending boom that we're seeing right now was a continuation of the trend that President Trump inherited, then, well, you know, they wouldn't get a high grade in graduate school for that assertion. And I can promise you that economic historians will 100 percent accept the fact that there was an inflection at the election of Donald Trump and that a whole bunch of data items started heading north. And so you don't have to really reach far for a theory of what happened. President Trump uh, deregulated the economy. We've talked about how that affects growth. The tax cuts have had exactly the predicted effect on the economy. That's brought uh, businesses back to the U.S., factories back to the U.S., and created jobs for ordinary Americans. Joining me now from Amherst, Massachusetts, to discuss the Trump administration's claims about the economy is Gerald Epstein. He is co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute and professor of economics at UMass Amherst. Thanks for joining, joining us again, Jerry. Sure, thanks for having me. So let's take a quick look at some of these graphs that Hassett presented on Monday. The first had mm -hmm. to do with a small business, uh, with small business optimism, and it shows how it shot up uh, with Trump's election in November 2016. He followed this with uh, business investment and then with capital goods orders and shipments. And uh, a journalist challenged him, asking him how it can be that Trump is credited with the boom on the day of his election, uh, which is basically this inflection point that he's talking about. And here's uh, how Hassett replied to this question. America's businesses especially, uh, that their, their activity is forward-looking. And so if you want to model their investment today, then you have to understand the fact that they're forming expectations not just about this month, but about the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And so if you look at what happened the moment that President Trump was elected, both in equity markets and, and in sentiment surveys, is that people started to ratchet up their expectations for what would happen to the economy. Perhaps you know, everybody except for uh, Mrs. Clinton's supporters was starting to do that right after the election. And the fact is that those expectations turned out to be rational. So, Jerry, how do you respond to this argument that it's all about expectations, which Trump ended up confirming, and where the expectations began on the day of Trump's election, and therefore that's where the inflection point is? Well, in fact, the day that Trump was elected, uh, the stock market dropped, uh, you know, 100, uh, several hundred points. It did soon recover, however, and uh, so uh, it, I think it is true that uh, once. Trump started making all of these very business-friendly appointments to his cabinet and, and brought all the bankers in uh, from Goldman Sachs and elsewhere and talked about deregulation, that yes, I do think the business, the capitalist class, small businesses, large businesses, expectations for uh, their profits, and that's what they're mostly concerned about, uh, did go up. And I think those uh, data, those graphs that he showed, do indicate a big uh, surge in expectations. The question is, uh, to what extent have those expectations really translated into real changes in economic activity by these companies uh, that uh, could they, will they benefit workers and will it trickle down? That's really the question. Well, yeah, that's uh, actually one of the questions uh, dealt with that speci uh, precisely. Um, and uh, the person raised it in terms of inequality. And Hassett argued, actually, uh, that uh, inequality is declining and the poor are doing better under Trump. Uh, we've got a clip here now from his reply to this question. The fact is that we're at a historic moment because we're deep into a recovery. The unemployment rate is really low and we've created a capital spending boom. And so normally what happens if you don't have a capital spending boom is that people start to bid up uh, the wages for folks, uh, but they're bidding them up because there's a shortage of, of labor. Uh, what's happening now is they're bidding up wages because people have better machines to work with and their productivity is going up. That means that the recovery can last longer, and that's really, really good for workers, especially at the low end. 
So it seems he's in, fa in effect arguing that higher that there have been higher capital expenditures uh, or investment, and this means greater productivity, and greater productivity translates into uh, more goods sold per worker, and workers can thus be paid more. Uh, what's your take on this? Okay, so let's unpack this. Uh, this is the key part of the, the argument by Hassett. Uh, so he showed some figures uh, that you mentioned earlier on that claiming that there was this big uptick in uh, investment, in particular uh, non-residential investment, that's investment in plant and equipment and uh, factories and so forth, um, that was, uh, took place right after Trump was elected. And uh, that can't be because of Trump, uh, at least initially, because it really does take time uh, for those things to get put into place. And in fact, nobody expected Trump to get elected, so they couldn't have planned before the election to do that. Uh, but if you go, so if you go back, actually, which I did, and look at the data on uh, investment, non-financial, non-residential uh, uh, investment, uh, over the last decade or so, uh, way be before uh, Hassett's figures, what you see is that what he, uh, Hassett is calling a boom actually took place also from 2008 to 2014. Uh, that there was a very big uptick in non-residential investment uh, during those Obama years. And then it is true, though he did, Hassett didn't talk about this, that investment really slowed down after 2014, uh, kind of leveled off uh, until around 2016, 2017. And the question is, you know, why did that happen? And there are a number of factors. But a key factor is uh, that the austerity programs that were pushed by the Republicans uh, during the Obama administration, uh, implemented the sequestration, tax cuts, government uh, spending declines, uh, that really uh, put a damper on investment, leveled it off. And so, you know, when the Republicans came in, the same ones who had been saying how terrible the deficit is and how we have to cut government spending, they came in and they cut this huge uh, tax, tax cut for the rich. and. Um, Everybody knows that tax cuts by themselves will increase uh, short-term demand and short-term spending, short-term growth. Uh, and that's, if we're, to some extent, uh, what we're seeing here. But of course, Hassett didn't say that the Republicans completely flipped on uh, this government spending tax cut issue uh, uh, when, when Trump came in. Now, uh, will this have a declining impact on inequality uh, if you have uh, somewhat more investment, uh, if, if productivity goes up somewhat more, will that raise wages? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you look back the 20, last 25 or 30 years, uh, productivity uh, has been growing much more rapidly than wages. There's been this huge wedge, which many people have pointed out, uh, between slower wage growth and rapid, rapid productivity growth. And um, there's not much reason why workers would be able to get uh, more of the fruits of their labor now than they did before, except for the fact that the unemployment rate is lower. And the unemployment rate is lower as a continuation of the Obama expansion, due largely to the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates low, and uh, the short-term impacts, perhaps, of the tax cuts. So very little of this has to do with the impact of a, an investment boom investment growth is just like what it was from 2008 to 2014, um, or uh, big changes in productivity growth. Yeah, I actually found that a little bit curious that he makes the argument that somehow uh, workers uh, negotiating for higher wages because of a shortage of labor is somehow bad, um, whereas productivity increases is good, and that this would lead to higher wages, which apparently doesn't really isn't really true. It seems, at least from the graphs I've seen. But I also want to ask you about another graph that Tahasid points to, which is uh, he shows that blue collar employment increased by 3.3 percent since Trump's election, presumably again having to do with greater capital expenditures which are made possible by the Trump tax cuts? Um, or is there a different explanation to this? Uh, what seemed, looks like, a, on the face of it, a jump in uh, blue-collar employment. What do you think of that? Well, I think there is some evidence coming out that there has been a jump in blue-collar employment. And um, I, it, it appears to be largely driven by changes in uh, the oil sector, uh, gas, oil, et cetera, uh, 
Oil prices have gone up since Trump uh, came in, and there's been um, an increase in, in oil production, oil exploration, uh, fracking, gas, and so forth. And uh, those create jobs and uh, blue-collar uh, blue jobs. And um, uh, so there may be something going on there. But of course, uh, this increase in these particular industries uh, generates huge problems with uh, cl climate change, greenhouse gases, et cetera. So um, it's not something that's sustainable in the long run, for sure. Finally, I just want to ask you about uh, the criticism that uh, many people have leveled against uh, Trump. I believe this is an argument that you've made as well, that the uh, tax cuts went mostly towards stock buybacks and dividends and not to real investment in the economy. Uh, is, that, uh, is that really true? I mean, we need to re do we have to revisit this issue? Well, no, I, th I think it's, it's still largely true, though uh, kind of an Econ 101 Keynesian model suggests that if you have a tax cut and it increases consumption spending, um, as it has, and households have been borrowing a lot more because they're more optimistic, that increases consumption spending. Then you have this thing called the accelerator, where investment also will go up to try to keep up uh, with the increased demand. And th these are all classic demand-side Keynesian kinds of processes which were cut short, which were eliminated uh, and since, uh, be between 2014 and 2016 because the austerity pushed by the Republicans and accepted by Obama and some of the Democrats. It wasn't just the Republicans that did this. And now uh, with the huge tax cuts for the rich that the Trump administration with the gleeful support of the Republicans has put in, you're going to see some of these demand side Keynesian kinds of expansions and investment and consumption. But it's not the supply side magic that Kevin Hassett and his people are hoping for, that it's all coming from more investment, more productivity growth, uh, wages going up as a result of productivity growth. Um, so far, there's not much evidence of that at all. OK. Well, we'll definitely continue to follow this as usual. I was speaking to Gerald Epstein, professor of economics at UMass Amherst. Thanks again, Jerry, for having joined us today. You're welcome. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.